Um, I'm just going to take about 15 minutes to present my research on Pakistan that I got into about a year and a half ago. And um, I will not be talking about specific projects in as much detail as Albert did. I will give you a broader overview of the Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan. Okay, so the Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan is not called the Belt and Road Initiative at all. Um, if you ask Pakistanis to know about the Belt and Road, they probably think you're talking about something related to some other part of the world. In Pakistan, it's known as CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And I'll elaborate on why this name has been given. And um, throughout the presentation, I have a, a large number of slides. I'll go through some of them very quickly, and I'll just make three key points. And I'll start with the first key point that I wanted to make, um, and that is the history of relations between um, Pakistan and China. Okay, so before we get to that, um, brief background on Belt and Road. All of you know this. It's a reviving of the ancient Silk Road. There is an um, overland route, and there is the um, maritime road as well. And you've seen different variations of this map, so I won't dwell on this. But I would like to um, spend a few seconds on this particular slide, and just to make the point that the corridor that is known as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is not the only corridor in the Belt and Road Initiative. There are six corridors in total, um, all of which have been listed here, and Pakistan-China Economic Corridor is one of them. Okay, so the first point that I wanted to make was that um, um, Unlike in some countries where China's involvement might have been more recent, in Pakistan, the involvement and the engagement with the country has a long history. And that history has to be taken into account when we're trying to understand the impact, the areas in which China is investing. So a bit about this relation. Um, Pakistan was one of the first non-communist countries to recognize China as a people's republic. This was in 1951. It was not the first. It was one of the first. Um, in 1963, China was the world's largest purchase of Pakistani cotton. There was a street strategic alliance developed between 1959 and 1979 and the building of a highway called the Friendship Highway across the northern border of Pakistan. And in 2013, CPEC began, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. It is considered to be a special relationship um, for uh, a number of reasons. Pakistan stood by China throughout the 20-year embargo by Western allies. It stood by China when China broke with the USSR the former Soviet Union, and it stood by China during the 1960s when China was going through a period of severe internal turmoil and famine. Pakistan also helped facilitate Nixon's visit to China in 1972. And after the 1989 June 4th crackdown, Pakistan was only one of two countries that stood by China when China was being increasingly isolated in the world. So when Xi Jinping visited China, um, sorry, when he, Xi Jinping visited Pakistan in April 2015, um, he used many glowing metaphors to describe the relationship. Um, he, says, he said, our relationship between China and Pakistan is higher than the mountains, deeper than the oceans, sweeter than honey, and stronger than steel. And some of you might have read about these in, in the media. And he says, in April 2015, this may be my first trip to Pakistan, but I feel as if I'm going to visit the home of my own brother. And that is how fondly um, China feels about the relationship bet between Pakistan. And the media wrote at that time during his visit, the Pakistan-China relationship has flourished like a tree growing tall and strong. So Pakistan has been independent for 71 years. For 66 of those years, it has had good relationships with China. So to understand CPEC, it's important to understand all this precursor and the relationship that has um, been in place prior to One Belt, One Road. Uh, just to continue with this quickly, China supported Pakistan in the 1965 India-Pakistan War. China helped Pakistan achieve nuclear status. And uh, so much so that in a 2014 Pew Research Center poll of countries that have a positive view of China, Pakistan came out number one in the sense that Pakistanis and the, uh, and the citizenry of Pakistan have the strongest view of, of China among a number of countries. So, and maintaining close relations with China is a central part of Pakistan's foreign policy. So this relationship, as I've said, has been in place for 66 years. It's gone through a number of phases, characterized by different events during different phases. Um, and it continues to this day. And here are some pictures from uh, the 50s, 60s, and, and very recent 
um, just to illustrate that relationship. And aside on, on Pakistan-Hong Kong relations, um, there is a relatively large Pakistani community. It's the fourth largest ethnic minority group in Hong Kong. Um, the consulate was opened in 1973. I think the most important point on this slide is that Pakistan and Hong Kong both adopt common law legal systems. So when talking to Hong Kong businessmen, um, especially those in the legal sector, one of the things that they feel is a, uh, a commonality that they can take advantage of are the common law legal systems that both um, employ. Okay, just quickly a brief background on Pakistan. 200 million people, not as populous as Indonesia, but the sixth most, sixth most populous country in the world. Its GDP is about 280 or 290 billion US dollars. It has a relatively young population, but the GDP per capita is very low. It is a, it is a developing, certainly a developing economy. Um, Pakistan has uh, borders with uh, four countries, India, Afghanistan, Iran, and China. The longest border is that of with, uh, is its border with India on the east side. With Afghanistan, it's also quite long. On the western side, with Iran, it's 959 kilometers, also to the west. And with China, it shares the shortest border, but most significant to the for the purposes of this presentation, because it is this border that is critical to understanding the Belt and Road Initiative in, in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan-China bilateral trade accounted to 19 billion in 2015. Okay, so that's, that's all I had for background. A few minutes used there. And now I'd like to talk about the corridor. So if you look at the definition of a corridor in a dictionary, a corridor is a long and narrow path. A long and narrow path. And if you just go back to this map of the country, you can see that it's a fairly long and narrow country. It's a fairly long and narrow country. And it's this geographical feature that is of relatively high importance, especially when you combine it with the border that it has with China. It, there is a seaport, so ch um, um, Pakistan has, has a, um, a front to the sea, and it is connected to China. So um, if China wants to trade with Middle Eastern countries, the shortest route is through Pakistan. Um, here are, some, here are some information about India and the Middle East and um, Afghanistan, but I won't dwell on those because our focus is not on that. It's rather on the Belt and Road Initiative related to China. And I think the best way to illustrate that is a map that I have here, just to cut to the chase. I'll go back and go over those slides that I've um, gone through, gone, I've skipped. But I think the key point here is that Pakistan represents a way for transportation links to Western China to take place using a much shorter route. 2,500 kilometers through, Western, uh, through Pakistan to Western China, whereas a traditional route would be 14,500 kilometers long. Okay? And that is the strategic geographic importance of Pakistan. Okay? So let me just go back to the slides that I, I went over quickly. Uh, the plans for a corridor stretching from the Chinese border to Pakistan's deep water ports on the Arabian Sea date back to the 1950s. So this is not new. Belt and Road in Pakistan is not new. Pakistan, like I've said, has had a long history and a long relationship with China. So this, the development of this corridor that is now under the umbrella of Belt and Road pre predated the Belt and Road. So People in Pakistan that I've talked to, when I did my research, I've been doing this research for about a year, and I've talked to different um, stakeholders in Belt and Road projects, including um, politicians, including bureaucrats, including industrialists, and including um, the workers who work on these projects. And from my research, I find that many people um, f have this feeling, maybe rightly or wrongly, that it was a relationship that China had with Pakistan that influenced China to engage in the Belt and Road Initiative itself. That it was this positive and strong relationship that might have tilted China's thinking in the favor of creating a larger Belt and Road 70 country uh, mega initiative that it is today. Chinese interest in Pakistan's deep water port at Gwadar, this is a location in Pakistan, was rekindled in 1998 and in 2002 construction began that was completed in 2006. And as you can see, all of these dates are before the formal announcement of Belt and Road by P President Xi Jinping. So just to reinforce that point, CPEC predates Belt and Road. So CPEC, at least partially, 
motivated Belt and Road, and it formed the initial arch arch architecture behind the Belt and Road Initiative. In Pakistan, this initiative comprises four pillars, energy, transportation, the port, this is the name of the port, and special economic zones. Up until this point, we have only seen these three categories of projects t um, take off, and the special economic zones have not yet been built. So the first point that I wanted to make was that there's a long history and there's a long context within which we have to understand the relationship of Pakistan and China to understand Belt and Road. The second point that I wanted to make is that Belt and Road in Pakistan at this moment is concerned with energy projects, transportation, building of transportation infrastructure, including the port. That is a pre, uh, that is a, that is the main focus of Belt and Road projects within Pakistan. So here's a picture of a signing of an MOU in 2013 um, with the then Prime Minister of Pakistan. The implementation framework of Belt and Road is through a joint cooperation committee chaired by ministers on both sides, in the Pakistani side and the Chinese side, under which there are different planning groups that meet at least two times a year to discuss developments and the progress of projects. So that's a map. I will come to that map later. So the reasons for creating a corridor. The corridor connects China to its markets in Asia, Europe, Middle East, and so forth. 80% of China's oil is transported through the Strait of Malacca to Shanghai, covering a distance of roughly 16,000 kilometers, taking two to three months. With the port operational in Pakistan, with the road network built up through that corridor, through the long and narrow country, the distance is reduced by one third, the time required to transport those goods and um, that oil is reduced by one third. And furthermore, pipelines to transport liquefied natural gas and oil to China from Iran are also facilitated through the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So, and the port of Gwadar is located only 400 kilometers from the port of Hormuz, the main channel of global oil transport. And China holds a 40 year license on the oper operation of Gwadar port in Pakistan. So Pakistan serves as a link not, there are 70, depending on who you, which source you look at, there are 68 to 73 countries in Belt and Road. Pakistan is one of the few countries, not the only country, that connects the road to the sea. Not all countries are able to boast of that connection of the land route and the, mar and the maritime routes. And Pakistan is able to do that because of its geographic location. So here's a, uh, some of the advantages to China for, for creating this... Um, Corridor, if we look at Europe to Western China transportation, the existing route is about 19,000 miles, 16,000 by sea, 2,600 miles by land. After the creation of this corridor, the total route is about 10,000 miles from 19,000, so it's reduced significantly. The freight charges and the time it takes are reduced significantly from 2,500 to about 3,000 US dollars to about to 1,000, reduced by one third. The time it takes for a 40-foot container from Hamburg to, to reach Shanghai is 50 days post CPEC after the creation of this corridor, 25 days. So transportation costs are lowered significantly. If we look at transportation from the Middle East to Western China, and, and the key point here to remember is I'm talking about Western China. I'm not talking about the coastal regions of Shanghai or, or Guangzhou. I'm talking about inland Chinese provinces, central and Western China. If you look at uh, Middle East to Western China, the total route is about 12,500 miles. Post uh, corridor, it comes down to 2,295 miles. Freight charges similarly are reduced significantly. The time it takes for goods to be transported are reduced significantly. And this is the map that I showed you before. I, I apologize for its quality, but I think it illustrates adequately that point that I've been hammering away at for the last few minutes. So the idea is that the, the corridor can act as a hub for Belt and Road, and it can break the development bottleneck of Western China and South Asia, promote business contacts between Western China and the rest of the world, and lead, it represents a demonstration effect for other countries as well, um, in the sense that Pakistan has had, a, like I said, 71-year history. No other country has invested as heavily as China is promising to invest now. And that demonstration effect has already led to the attraction of investment from uh, countries that had previously never considered Pakistan as an investment location. The advantages, Pakistan's comparative advantage is strong willingness to cooperate. As I've said, 
the, the um, leadership is very keen and interested in cooperating with China. It uh, meets its development goals. It has a large population. Urbanization is increasing. English is a popular language. And we have a young population. And there are close trade, close trade connections between Pakistan and China. China's investment in Pakistan has been growing in recent years. Bilateral trade volume is high. And Pakistan is one of the key markets for China's foreign contracting projects. And this comes at an opportune time for Pakistan as well, because it would like to develop its infrastructure to transition from a predominantly agricultural economy to an industrial-based economy. So these infrastructure projects are being welcomed with open arms because it represents an opportunity to build the roads, to build a, a rail network, to, to build a port, so as to create the conditions to develop and become an emerging economy similar to Turkey, Brazil, and so forth. OK, um, so the Chinese investment is, is projected to be about 54 billion, which is about 17% of Pakistan's GDP now. Um, and of this, two thirds will be in energy projects, coal, water, and renewable energy. So the first point I wanted to make, there's a long history and context behind this relationship. The second point I wanted to make is that the majority of the projects are going into three areas, energy, uh, infrastructure, and also the port. And the final point that I'd like to make, I'll just skip through these slides and show you the pictures because there's, there's less text. The final point that I want to make is that it's not all rosy. Um, the timeline for CPEC is early harvest projects to be completed by this year, short-term projects by 2020, medium-term projects by 2025, and long-term projects by 2030. And here are some pictures and some superficial details about the energy projects. The third point I wanted to make as I go through these slides um, and you, you look at the pictures, is that um, there's considerable skepticism in Pakistan as to whether Belt and Road will actually lead to the promise of success and development that it has been touted as giving. Um, and the reason for that are manifold. First of all, there is a um, question about the local um, bureauc bureaucracy its ability to handle 54 billion worth of investment. Pakistan in its history has not had such a large amount of investment that it promised to receive within five or seven years. Since it will represent the cumulative amount of investment that Pakistan has had since independence. Now whether that a country that has the capacity and the wherewithal to manage that is, is a severe one. Um, other questions uh, relate to some cynicism. This is the port in Gwadar. There's some cynicism in Pakistan as to whether China has ulterior motives. There are some quite valuable resources in Pakistan that many people uh, claim that China would like to get its hands on. Uh, Pakistan is not able to extract those resources because it's very um, expensive and you need uh, relatively sophisticated technologies. And there's some cynicism and questioning as to what the longer term motives of China are. Generally speaking, there is a, there's a welcoming of this um, investment from China, but despite the welcoming of investment from some sectors of society, not least industrialists and um, citizenry, there are these questions that I've, I've mentioned, and I'll ha be happy to elaborate on them and answer questions on them during the Q&A. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you for your attention.